District of Conservation is sponsored by CFACT. To learn more about our sponsor, head over to CFACT.org. Thank you so much for listening. Welcome to District of Conservation. I'm your host, Gabriella Hoffman. This podcast offers a sober examination into all things hunting, fishing, shooting sports, energy, environment, and the public policy surrounding it. And this podcast also specializes in original interviews that you won't hear elsewhere. Here's what I have for you today. Keeping up with interviews, today I want to bring you a conversation with one of my really good friends, Cindy Wynn, who is an athlete, a fishing athlete more specifically, with Columbia Sportswear, and she has worked in the fishing industry for many, many years and is someone that oozes positivity and really has such a compelling story. Cindy has a big heart. If you meet her, ever interact with her, one of the nicest people around, and we clicked instantly upon meeting at several SHOT shows ago, five, six years ago, over having a mutual love of fishing, coming from similar family backgrounds. Her family also fled communism, but from Vietnam, mine from Eastern Europe, slightly different times, but a lot of commonalities, and she's going to tell her story. She's going to recount why she loves fishing, her work with Columbia Sportswear, and having a foray into hunting because she loves doing that as well. And we've been around for several of her hunting milestones, which she talks about. And it's really fun that we've been able to do that together um, to help her achieve certain milestones in hunting. I'm going to let Cindy take it away from here. I think you guys will love hearing about her and her fishing story. And be sure to connect with her on social media. Here is our conversation with Cindy Wynn. Check it out. Cindy, welcome to District of Conservation. It's good to talk to you in another interview format again. Hi. Um, It's been so nice to talk to you too today. So I'm excited to see what we've got going on. I want you to tell my listeners your backstory and how you got involved in fishing because some people who may be following me have probably seen us post together. They know that we're really good friends. We have a similar family history, albeit from different countries. Tell everyone your backstory and how you got involved in fishing. Well, um, a lot of my um, passion for fishing, or actually my passion for fishing, basically came from my family. That's where it all started. So I grew up fishing with my parents. Um, Nothing fancy, just, you know, hopping around the beaches and the piers of Galveston. And um, that seemed to always be our go-to for a pastime, you know, growing up. And so I kind of resonate with that every time I get out in the water like that. It just takes me back to, you know, the really good memories of my parents and my family. Um, you know, it stems from my siblings to my cousins and, you know, anybody I I meet and, you know, bring into my life. Like, usually it starts either they are interested in fishing or they somehow cross paths with me in some way or another with um you know, getting out there and catching and cooking and, you know, being a part of gathering with my family. So a lot of that um, fishing stuff is just, it's its all part of like my family, really. So um, starting off with that, I, I kind of fell into as far as like fishing for a sponsorship as an accident, really never really planned on working with different companies in the industry or having anything more to do with fishing other than, you know, a a pastime. And as, you know, as I I got older and I was in high school and the advent of social media and things like that, I started sharing my stories um, across my social channels and connected with a lot of folks who had the same passion And by doing that, um, it led me to meeting, you know, a lot of folks and different companies. And I caught wind of um, a lot of influential people and got out there. And my pictures and stories became part of, like, publications. And it all just kind of ran from there kind of the rest is history. What type of fishing did you first incline yourself to? And do you now do multiple styles? You don't just do spin and bait. You also do a little bit of fly fishing. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I really don't hold myself to any one kind of fishing. Um, I pretty much am an angler with no barriers. I, I fish a lot of saltwater because that's where, you know, I was raised right here on the Texas coast. 
but I do um, love to be in the fresh water as well. And I've done quite a bit of um, fly fishing experiences, a few with you um, that were really amazing um, in different places. And, you know, just, it's, I think the only thing I haven't really tried is the stuff in the north, which is like ice fishing or salmon fishing, things like that. I have not gone into any of that realm, but um, I did try a little bit in Trail Creek, Indiana for a steelhead. I think those are implanted there, though. They're not native, but it was an amazing experience. And I'd like to go back and try to do a little bit more freshwater fishing if I could. The steelhead, even if they are implanted and non-native, at some point in their journey, there's there's still fish that are worth targeting. I did it in Pennsylvania two years ago myself, and it was still a very fun type of fishing because at the Atlantic salmon fishery is not very strong. The Pacific salmon is pretty okay in, in I would say, in Alaska. I know they have some trouble with it in the Pacific Northwest in Washington state and Oregon, but I think those steelhead, even if they are hard or even if they are raised in these fisheries, in these hatcheries, rather, they're still okay. And they're still sport fish worthy of targeting and oh. pursuing. So no. And, and we had fun at headwaters on the so queen. That was, oh my gosh, pre COVID 2019. That was a fun event. I don't know when we're going to do something similar like that. I haven't spoken to Mark lately, but he's been very busy and that's a good thing. But even if it's yeah. just that one event, we had a great time, a good showing of women, and I hope it fostered your interest in fly fishing, too, and I know it did. Um, Absolutely. I, I don't think I've ever had a freshwater experience that I, you know, regretted. And I honestly, like, after being in these, you know, in these streams and creeks and things like that, sometimes I wonder, like, if my end game is actually going to be freshwater. <laughs> How am I going to just have a little property with a pond instead of, you know, being on the coast? Because it sure is a lot easier sometimes to just, you know, dust it all off and not have to wash everything down <laughs> when you're done. So I don't know. It would be hard to pick between the two because it depends on my mood. And maybe you're the same way, too. If yeah. I'm in the mood for like saltwater fishing, I want to be somewhere in Florida or in Virginia's coast and go fishing with the spin rod for cobia, redfish, or even mahi-mahi. Although to get some of the really nice saltwater species, you have to go miles upon miles. And I'm not too privy on where Virginia is situated. We have canyons, which would be fun to go to, but with gas prices being ridiculous and the cost of maintenance, I think the charters to go way, way out to where you would find mahi or blue tuna would probably be too expensive. Uh -huh. um, and then I have like in the winter time, I have the mood of like, I want to go fly fishing for trout because it's cold water now and highly oxygenated conditions and the trout are going to thrive. They're stocking them. So I'm all mood dependent on where I want to fish. I, like you, I'm an equal opportunity fisher, angler, and it's a lot of fun, but I, I don't think I could just settle on like fr freshwater fishing for the rest of my life. I like living on a coastal state where you get both. That is true. I mean, I definitely, um, it, it is a mood driven kind of thing for me. Um, I just, I just feel sometimes that like being on the lake, I, I just, I don't know. I, I just get taken back sometimes like, Ooh, this was a lot more fun than I thought it would be, you know, cause a lot of times we're targeting bass and they're highly aggressive predators and it just makes it, you know, I'm just like, why, why did I, why was I missing this in, in so much of my life? You Amen. Know. Yeah, it's it's mood dependent. I say fish everywhere, fish all the time. You can fish year round. I think most people don't know that that you can fish near, all year year round in most states for oh, the most yeah. part, unless you live like closer to Canada in one of those states that border. I mean, you could ice fish, of course, but I don't know. It feels like those of us in the southeast, including Texas, too, where you live. You can kind of fish almost all year round comfortably without freezing your bones off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I definitely fish all year round and even like on conditions where, you know, days where it's blistering cold and I probably, anybody else would not be out in the water. Those are some of the best fishing days for me because one, there's not a whole lot of folks down the water. And two, I mean, if you find these fish, they are all huddled up in one spot. <laughs> so it's pretty, it's pretty cool to you know be diverse and have like so many different um you know experiences that that you could 
triers, you can all, all experience it here in Texas for fishing, whether it's saltwater or freshwater streams or lakes or bays. And, you know, every little puddle to me has fish in it if it's been sitting there for at least two weeks. So always look for, forward for that. I don't know if you view yourself as an influencer in the fishing industry. I think you're a a good influencer and the influencer labels should be positive when applied to people like you, because you represent the sport really well, but being a influencer, so to speak, you've cultivated a relationship with one of the most well-known brands, Columbia sports, where you've, I think had that relationship now for a decade or close to it. How are you able to cultivate it and what do they allow you to do and what makes that relationship so special because every brand is different some brands may not allow you creative kind of freedom to do things but talk about that collaboration and what they've enabled you to do and support your fishing endeavors so when columbia reached out to me they pretty much had done their research i think they had been following my fishing stories for about two years before they even made contact with me and um it was it's been such a cool journey working with them because, you know, I don't know if you've looked at some of my numbers on social media. I don't have, you know, a hundred thousand followers on Instagram, you know, but the followers that I do have are pretty engaged in what I do, whether it's my family or, you know, my fishing or my pets, whatever it may be, you know, and I think that, um, is pretty valuable for companies like that. Um, a lot of the folks that reach out to me have been wearing Columbia just as myself for, you know, their entire life. And when Columbia reached out to me, I was already, you know, working or was already wearing some of their stuff. Um, and I, I got to go out to corporate and kind of talk about that and sit down with their design team and kind of give them a rundown of my my day on the water. And the cool thing about Columbia is, you know, a lot of companies, they, they put you, you know, they give you the tools and everything, but do they actually really hear what you have to say, you know, about some of their products? And Columbia really allows me to test out their, their products and give my um, two cents on what I think, you know, could be improved or what I don't do and don't like. And they seem to listen to, you know, to a lot of it and make these considerations whenever they go back to their line. Um, that is definitely part of it that keeps my relationship really good with them. Um, another thing is, you know, some of the projects that we've worked on in the past have really resonated, like with why I fish and they, I had a project um, that we did a couple years ago that was based on sustenance fishing, which is basically what my family back in Vietnam um, survived on and, and what they still do to this day. And so we did a little piece on that. We flew all the way back to um, Vietnam and did that part. And then they also filmed a little piece from um, the Seychelles, which is another, you know, form of that is like, you know, a, that is like the beautiful side of like sport fishing, like traveling, doing all of that. And then they also went to the Florida Keys, which is like the Mecca of sport fishing. Like when you think of sport fishing in the United States, you think of Florida, you know? So they put it all together and just kind of showed a story, you know, from, from beginning to end. And I think whenever they, you know, have these kind of projects, I mean, it's, it means a lot more to me than just something that we're slapping together and throwing on, you know, social media. I mean, they use my grandmother's um, voice in the voiceover for a lot of the stuff that I was doing with them. And it's just, I think at that moment when just listening back to those clips, I just felt like no matter if I was sponsored or not by Columbia, they're definitely going to be a brand that I will always side with, you know, for the rest of my life. So um, I hope to be able to, you know, this is my ninth year with them and I hope to be able to um, continue that relationship with them and also, you know, to continue, you know, sharing the passion that I have for fishing with others because, you know, things are, are a lot different than, than it was when we were kids, you know, I don't, 
as much as I love social media, I think that it definitely is a scary place sometimes when um, looking back on like how we grew up, always getting pushed to go outside, do all these things. And now, you know, people are just stuck into their electronics a whole lot more. So and I just feel like um, working with brands that just try to keep you on the water for as long as you can, keep you out outdoors and enjoying these kind of things is is why I fish and why I want to keep working with them. It seems like they want to continue to entrust you as a brand ambassador for them. If they've worked with you this long and they believe in your brand and your mission, I have no doubt they'll continue to work with you. On the other side, recently we, we were talking about having you share this, but you reached a milestone a little bit separate of fishing. I brought you along with me as my guest for Hunter Recruitment Project's ninth sponsored hunt, they, one of their group hunts. And, and we've had Jamie Shira on the podcast and they're really great. And we went down to South Georgia in October where we and a bunch of other ladies of all different experience levels got to do some deer management, dope patrol. And you got to reach a milestone even in your hunting journey because we, you got your first, I would think, animal ever when we were together in South, uh, Northern Georgia when we were fishing at Mark's headwaters yeah. on the Soqui Lodge and you got your pig. I had got a pig too, but it ran away and all we got left was the skull. But you oh were God. able to, you were able to get another milestone kind of in the bigger game species realm. So talk about that experience with your first deer. Oh, I know. You've definitely shared some incredible life experiences with me. Um, this one, however, um, was my first deer. Um, I've gone hunting in the past and been unsuccessful, you know, just kind of learning and sitting out in the blinds. But this was my first successful trip. Um, and I did, I was able to um, get my first harvest out there with you. I was um, working with my mentor who was Mike Kern out there. He is incredible and so patient. And I hunted with him for three days. And at the end of the trip, like right hours before we had to go to bed and fly out, I was able to um, harvest my first year. So, you know, it, it's, it's such a humbling experience, you know, whenever you are, I don't know, I, I feel like whenever I'm doing a sport where you're, you're harvesting any kind of animal, it's, it's something that you have, it's, it's spiritual almost, like you have to be in tune with it because you, yes, you're killing something and you're, but you're turning around and putting food on the table for your family. You know, this is like something that, that I was taught when, you know, really young, um, you know, being able to harvest something and take it home and being able to prepare it and share it so that, you know, your family and friends can come and gather. And I can't wait to finally get the processed meat back so that I can, it'll come my family here. <laughs> it'll come. We it's just, we just so have to be exciting. patient. Yep. And so, um, I think that's just, you know, that, that was my, that was my first one. I definitely, after doing that, um, taking that one down, I've, I've definitely felt like hunting is something that I want to continue to learn. Um, and also, you know, build friendships and relationships around these things so that you now I have a little bit more to do than just fishing sometimes. And, I loved it. I love, you know, being at camp with everybody. I love meeting all these people who, you know, are just incredible. And, you know, they, they've got so much knowledge that I can, you know, I, I just didn't feel like we were there long enough and I never do on these kind of trips. I never it went feel by like too fast. We have, it's so fast. And I just feel like, Oh, can we just get like another weekend, you know, but it's, it'll be really cool to, you know, get back out there with you this year and, you know, try to get some more, some more meat, um, in the freezer and, you know, just be able to share these experiences so that others can, you know, try to find their way and do the same things that we're, we're getting to do as well. We absolutely will. And we were talking about that and 
we have plenty of time to do some planning. I think at minimum, we'll do some fishing, kind of switch it up this this year. But if I get more opportunities for hunting, I will definitely bring you along. What are some trade shows that you have on the pipeline this year? Because you do frequent the trade show circuit. Anything on your on your plans this year? Honestly, um, Miami Boat Show might be one of them um, that I might I might get out there for in February. It just kind of depends on the schedule and um, if I need to make an appearance or anything for Brunswick Mercury. And because uh, I don't think Columbia ever really goes to that one. And then of course ICAST. So I have those two that I look forward to every year, and it's been pretty regular for me. So other than that, like anything else that comes along, I'm, I'm open to it. But um, Miami Boat Show and ICAST are usually the ones that I, I always keep on my calendar. Have you looked at the trout show, the fly fishing trout conference rather that I sent to you? I think it's in Texas Hill Country in February. I want to try to go to that for yes. Poma. And you know what? I think the reason why I didn't, I wasn't able to do that one because it falls on... I want to say February 26th, and that is the same weekend or same time that my dad passed away. So every year Mm. my family gets together now to um, celebrate his life. So, Of course, understandable. But good news this year, it is being held February 17th to the 19th. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, well, I'll have to check on that then. There was something else that was on the 26th. Maybe it was Bo's event. It could um, be. There's also, also the fly fishing event. Yes, I think this year it's the Texas Fly Fishing and Brew Festival, which is hosted by Bo's, Bo Beasley. And I think this year, oh, yes. that's going to be on the anniversary of your father's passing. Yes, mm-hmm. that yeah, one is. Yeah, that's the one. Then maybe that's the one I was confused with. Yeah, that was the one I I knew that was in. Um, I think it's in Midland, Mesquite. Texas, or something. Oh, Mesquite. Mesquite. You're right. Yep. But at least you can try to go to the Trout Fest one because that would be. That would be kind of cool. Well, if you're, yeah, if you're here, um, well, I'll tr- definitely try to make my way there. And we'll try to plan yeah. on it. I'm trying to work with one of my fellow Poma board members to do our fishing outreach and possibly go there. There could be some opportunities. We'll see. Nothing, nothing I is fine. <laughs> I definitely need to try to do a little bit more fly fishing. I have all the equipment. The Guadalupe is beautiful. I, I know. I love it. I, I, out there we took the kids out there to do some um floating down the river this year but didn't get to do much fishing but i've i've done that in the past with some of my girlfriends and it's a lot of fun anytime you're trout fishing in the stream is pretty fun but yes i definitely need to get back out there and try to do that absolutely no every even a bad day on the water is a good day in general i had that recently i went to a place and it wasn't the most successful fishing and it was really warm. It was the last day, second to last day of the year. And it was like a pay for access stream. It's not like the method of which is bad. It's just sometimes even when you pay to do private access stream fishing, sometimes the conditions just don't cooperate and that happens. And I lost a few flies, nothing super expensive, but it always frustrates me when I'm doing rookie mistakes, (laughs) getting flies snagged (laughs) and removed Um, and seeing the fish and they don't bite it which is frustrating too. Like they're right there. They've just been stalked from what the owner says and they're not biting that and cooperating. Like story of my life. It's so funny, especially like with um, like tarpon fishing. I've taken so many people out with me who want to enjoy the same things and sh- try to share these experiences. And they will, like my sister and James, they both, they both caught their first tarpon like on their first try on their first day. And I'm just like, what? And I, it took me so long to finally catch my, my tarpon. And, and now I've, I've lost count. But at that time when I was trying, it was the most frustrating thing because they're literally circling you in a daisy chain and you are just, and they're just ignoring everything you're throwing at them, you know, and I get out there and I, I show somebody else and they instantly catch their fish and they're just like, well, that wasn't so hard. I'm like, oh, y'all have no idea how lucky you are. Sometimes <laughs> but, people have better luck than us more seasoned anglers. It happens, oh unfortunately, God. but you love it seeing people so succeed. It is. It's so, it's so cool though, to, you know, be able to share those experiences. I honestly, to be honest with you, I just, I get so much more out of watching and 
taking somebody out to go do something that I've been able to do in my past that um, it's, it's just more fulfilling for me now, you know, than to actually go out there. I don't have like a bucket list of fish or anything anymore where I like, I have to catch the fish. Like I just want the experience. I just want to be out in the water as much as I can and, you know, be able to share that with, you know, my loved ones as much as, you know, I can, because that's, that's what it's all about, right? At the end of the day is these life experiences. You know, you don't, when you're on your dying days, like you don't look back and think how many days you could have worked or how many days you could have done anything else. You just, you don't get to take anything with you when you go except for these life experiences. And that's what I'm trying to collect (laughs) as much as I can. And the science is there. I don't know if you're familiar with the blue mind theory, which says that your mind is at rest and ease. And I I think I've talked about the book before, but really great marine biologist by the name of, um, gosh, what is his name? I forget. Oh, Wallace J. Nichols. There we go. Dr. Wallace J. Nichols of California. I forget what institution he's tied to, but he's really pioneered this idea or brought it more to the forefront in a formalized way, like a concrete explanation of why people are, um, doing this. And so it's just really cool to, you know, have fishing, encourage this, or anytime you're by the water, you're having this really sense of tranquility, serenity, and so much more when you're fishing, much like boating or kayaking or jet skiing. So water activities like this are great and fishing very much falls into it. So Sid, if people want to connect with you, what can they do to follow your work, work with you, support your efforts, learn more about your partnerships with some of the big companies? Anybody that wants to get a hold of me, I'm pretty easy to um, to find on social media. You can either put in my first and last name and fishing, and you should be able to find it on Google. Um, my website is cindywinfishing.com and... You know, you can reach out to me there, send me a message and, you know, find out what I'm doing. I, you have been doing a calendar on my website. So, um, yeah, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. So, you know how to do that with me on Instagram or, or social media. So I keep that, my lines pretty open for anybody that wants to reach out. You know, I get a lot of folks who want to, you know, ask me questions about, what to do or where to go. I mean, I have a blog on my website as well of some of my fishing adventures. And I like to share with folks how I got there, what I was fishing for, what was my target, you know, where I stayed, you know, what it cost, things like that. So feel free to reach out. You're the real deal. That's why we're friends. I've loved following your journey since we first connected on social media, which feels like almost forever ago. And I love supporting your work and I appreciate you telling your story because I think it's worth telling. And you really are such a positive role model, positive role model to younger anglers, anglers who are new to the sport and really showcase what it means to be a representative of the fishing industry, Cindy. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You're very welcome, Gabriella. I look forward to seeing you again soon. And thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to District of Conservation. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you haven't already, make sure you find us on your preferred podcast player. We largely circulate on Apple, Spotify, and countless others, but those are our two big podcast platforms we want to push. Make sure you're subscribed there, especially on Apple. If you like the podcast a lot, go leave us some reviews. We'd be more than grateful to get some five-star reviews from you guys. Moreover, we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and a little bit on YouTube. We don't populate there, but connect with us on social media. Find me personally on social media with blue check marks. Super easy to find, and I would love to hear your feedback and know who you'd like to see on the podcast. Thanks for listening to District of Conservation. Stay tuned for the next episode.